Hello everyone, it's Friday night and the Weekender is about to kick off. On this week's show, Ben gets stuck into some hobbit holes, Free is in a purple haze, Justin takes a look at some 3D printing, and I talk about Saga, for example. Also this week, one lucky subscriber will be in with a chance to win a copy of Warhammer Age of Sigmar Extremis from store.untabletop.com. If you want to get your hands on a copy of that box, all you need to do is stick a comment below, like the video, be a subscriber to the channel. And if you can share this around to your friends on social media, then do this thing. It really helps. Otherwise, we're going to get stuck into the show. Sit back and relax because your weekend starts here. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Friday night. It's Weekender time, and I have with me Justin Free and Ben to take you through all the latest and greatest from across the tabletop gaming industry. However, uh, before we get kicked into that, there's a few bits of news for people who may be interested in such things. Uh, first off, and briefestest of all, is no Weekender next week. Uh, we are replacing them with a slew of Halloween goodness. Ooh. So for the uh, spookiest of seasons, for all you fans of Sweden <laughs> out there, uh, we will be having a game of Warfrip and mm. uh, those dark places mm -hmm. uh, to wet your Halloween whistles. There may or may not be pumpkin involved. Time to <laughs> tell. Um, so just to let you know, we will return the following week in November. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, also, if you obviously will be missing us terribly uh, next week, so just to let you know, the week after, um, the 3rd of November, I want to say, when before we get back for the weekender, um, we will be doing a slew of content for Corvus Belly's upcoming Tag Raid. Oh. This is their multiplayer deathmatch game. Mm -hmm. um, we've already done some stories on it. Mm -hmm. If you haven't been paying attention, you can go over to the game hub uh, on tabletop.com and have a look at some of the stories we put out already, where it takes a look at some of the tags and prospectors and other features that you can uh, get stuck into. However, if that only wet your whistle, if you want to see a bit more, then Corvus Belly have already set up the Infinity Deathmatch Tag Raid website uh which is infinityuniverse.com forward slash games forward slash tag all the forward slash all the forward <laughs> slashes however in here you can uh download the demo rulebook um take another look at the background behind what's going on and who the various companies are um the rulebook itself is delightful this is um it's i want to say it's the current version uh, obviously, it may still change between now and Kickstarter and final release. Yep. However, it gives you a good idea of what's going on with the game. And if that's not enough, if you really want to get stuck in beforehand, there is a tabletop simulator version where oh, you awesome. two can mm -hmm. play out the games of mining exploitation and mega beast stomping uh, <laughs> across the digitized interwebs. So there you have that. Like I say, there's going to be an awful lot of stuff coming. Carlos was over in the studio. We played a game. I'm not going to say who won. It wasn't Shay. <laughs> <laughs> he, has, finally, he has been. Finally, he's been beaten on camera. This is what he happens has, when you bring in young you blood. You got it. Yeah. He has been kicking ass on camera. I will mm. say that. Yeah. Uh, but apart from that, uh, Killian's up with Carlos as well. We sit down, we have a look at the miniatures, and we talk about the yeah. game. And there's a That's whole slew of stuff coming. So that will be the first week of November, starting on, I believe, the 3rd, just so you get the heads up on that, because we don't want you missing out just because we're all drunk next week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jerry, you, you say drunk. I will be chained to an editing desk to make sure everybody gets their yummy, yummy content. Okay. He does that drunk. <laughs> <laughs> don't listen. 
<laughs> no, he'll, lies. He'll still be hammering the shots back. <laughs> lies and defamation. It's like a bar in there. <laughs> he sounds the whimsy. Okay, shall we take a look at the most important part of the week? Uh, oh, yes. yes. Shall we get stuck into our indie of the week? Yeah. And this week, Ben, our indie of the week is... Well, uh, we did something a little bit sort of quirky, a little bit weird, because <laughs> we're like that, yeah. Uh, and this is, we're going to be looking at Micro Art Studios, but obviously a lot of people know Micro Art Studios for doing lots of fantastic stuff with all their terrain mm -hmm. and Volsung, which is a fantastic little game that we've talked about in the past. Uh, but one thing that very few people actually know about is their really awesome little Discworld miniatures collection that they do officially for the Discworld books. Okay. Uh, and of course, I had to put these out because Jerry loves a little bit of Discworld. Don't oh. you, Jerry? Don't you, Jerry? Yeah. I, I, I know, Jerry. What Jerry's a fan, no? Yeah. <laughs> I have a copy of the Fifth Elephant signed by oh. Terry Pratchett that oh. says, To Jerry, thanks for giving me all my ideas. <laughs> Brilliant. You're amused, Jerry. I am. Yeah. <laughs> At the very least, I'm amusing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so where are we going to go to first? Shall we take a look at the Discworld shop or should we go straight to Micro Arts? We'll go, we'll go to the Discworld shop. So uh, over on the actual website for Discworld, um, they have listed off a whole bunch of the different miniatures they have in this collection. Mm. So uh, just to give you a sort of brief overview of them, uh, they're all 30 millimeter. Uh, they're all metal miniatures. Uh, and they are incredibly well detailed. Uh, they're all based very much on that, on obviously the style of artwork and things you'll be familiar with from the book covers and that kind of stuff too, which is always nice. And they've basically covered the whole gamut of everything you could want from Discworld. So obviously you've got all your deaths in there. You've got to have all your deaths in there. But then you've got your favourites like Rinse Wind and everything there too as well. But um, if you like a particular character from the Discworld range, there's probably one in here. Mm. I will say they're listed at 32. Some of them are considerably bigger. Carrot, <laughs> Carrot is meant to be a big boy for a dwarf. Quite, Ca yes. Carrot comes yeah. in about 45 mil. Wow. Uh, That's cool. And yeah. detritus, is, mm -hmm. detritus is a lump of lead that you can kill a man with. <laughs> so, you know. I've, size, I've sizes may vary depending on the character involved. Um, yeah. And I'm 100% okay with this. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's Discworld. It's Discworld. I do not really expect consistency. Oh, no, they are consistent. Everything consistent is, in their oddity. Consistent, yeah. exactly. Yeah, they're consistent in scale. <laughs> and now they all got a broomstick. Yeah, oh, so these are great. Essentially, they break down um, into, I suppose you could almost have them, the guards... Uh, Rincewind and Witches series, so they're they're plucked from the relevant books. Uh, sometimes they're main characters. In other cases, you've got people like the world's second greatest lover. He tries harder, <laughs> Diego Casanova, <laughs> and the Canting Crew. So people will know Duckman, What Duck, Farlo Ron, uh, Arnold Sideways, and Coffin Henry. And Gaspood comes with Farlo Ron on his base. Yes! You'll get better pictures on the uh, the Microart Studio page. But I like oh. the fact that it's not just um, the main characters you do get to see beyond that. Uh, the Discworld shop that we're on, discworld.com, uh, was originally paulkidby.org um, because these are all based on Kidby's illustrations from the yeah. Pratt Pratchett portfolio and yeah. the art of the disc. So he had a very distinct style, um, which really brought to life what I've always sort of thought of the uh, the Discworld characters. Same here, and, yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, you know, I know a lot of people like Josh Kirby's work, um, but oh my god, no, please no, Josh. Uh, they, they were they were very mm, weren't they? Uh, and I quite like Paul's more realistic take on things mm -hmm. rather than muscles being you know bags of muscles. As you can see, there's uh, he's actually used the Kidby artwork for each of the sections here. Um, so we'll we'll dive in. We'll take a look at everybody's favourite and obviously the best set, the Night Watch. Yes. Oh. I've actually been rereading uh, cards and stuff at the moment, and it's it's so much fun. It's mm. so weird reading the books again after like a really long time because you forget yeah. that they're not done in a typical way. Like it's just almost like just a stream of consciousness. 
mm. <laughs> which I think is so much weird, so weird compared to like normal books and things. But it's just so funny. Like, uh, and, and it's always nice to see the characters brought to life in this way because yeah. then you can kind of place them really nicely. And I like that a lot of the miniatures that you see here are so intrinsically tied to that artwork that is so familiar yeah. to people and the descriptions of the characters. Yes. Because when I was seeing this, I was like, that is Vimes. That's how I view Vimes. Kind of <laughs> the, yeah. Full disclosure, I, I have never gotten into Terry Pratchett's work. Oh, I love Terry Pratchett, but Discworld isn't one that I have read to its fullest. I know about Discworld, but I don't. Mm. Uh... I see. I've seen the movies, but that's about it. But oh. my, my question always is, sorry, Jerry. <laughs> my question always is, what is the best book to start? Because it's so expansive. You don't know where to begin. Where is your Guards, jump Guards, off? Guards, 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 Guards. Yeah. Really? I would, yeah. it, people have different... Some people would say Color of Magic, but... No, I love no, Color of Magic. I, wouldn't, I would say do not start with Color of Magic and Light Fantastic because they are twin That's books. Right. Right. Um, but they are not what the Discworld developed into. They are more humorous fantasy and just okay. hit a lot of fantasy tropes and things are very different. Over time, the Discworld developed in a very certain way. So death, death doesn't kill people. Death is just there at the end of life. Whereas in the color of magic, he deliberately stalks Rincewind. When Rincewind escapes, he gets annoyed and kills things. <laughs> Those two books, while technically they are part of the Discworld, they do not read like the Discworld does. I really okay. like, I really like the way he's done Sergeant Colon, and I don't know why, but I think there was a, a sergeant from Heartbeat, the the Nick Berry set the 50s in the middle the of the one who eats all the biscuits you mean. Uh, and he just reminds me of him yeah yeah, yeah. Smiley face. i yeah. don't know if that's <laughs> deliberate or not uh, but i i want to God, know his heartbeat man yeah. all right well jerry just just for you i will get guards guards on I, I, I would really with, recommend it yeah, yeah. essentially you've got you've got three series and then standalone books in the desk mm. world the night watch series that all feature these characters um mm. and start with you know the young dwarf Captain Kara Ironfanson coming to Ankh-Morpork and starting to do things like arrest thieves guild members, which is just bang out of order. Um, oh, and so that, that sets up a whole series of books, which is great. And sometimes those characters will appear in other people's books, maybe tangentially. Mm. Um, they've got the witches' books, which are really solid. Um, and I, I, maybe it's because as I've got older, I've, I've got closer to Vimes uh, and, <laughs> and less... <laughs> Less to Granny Weatherwax over time. Um, right. I, but, I, I hear words; they sound familiar, but they and, mean the, and then the wizards. The wizards' books are mostly around Winds Wind and occasionally the the actual um, head of the Unseen University and, and sort of oh. the, the Arch Chancellor and the various members of the teaching staff. So okay. you've got these three distinct sets of books that follow, and they're they're all in the same universe and, and have similar feels to them, but they they explore different sort of aspects. And then there's there's well, a bunch that are just sort of one offs. Like mm. small gods, how do gods begin and how do gods die? And mm -hmm. so, uh, Terry Pratchett universe is so interesting to me because I've been bits of Terry Pratchett universe, but not full into the entirety. Mm. So I've read the Color of Magic, and there's so many bits missing, and it really does create this whole universe. Um, I've been uh, feeling the need to get back into Terry Terry Pratchett recently and rereading. Need a bit of whimsy in my life. Um, mm. Ah, you've just reignited this. So uh, thanks, guys. <laughs> uh, I mean, I when say, I go home for lunch, I, I will pick up my Kindle and see if I can find it. I will say that the reason I'm not a fan of the movie slash the cartoons weren't bad, actually. The PC game is pretty good as the well. The Channel 4 so. ones. Yeah. But there's so much written that can't be transposed to, you know, internal monologue can't be mm -hmm. uh, shown on TV. Footnotes. The footnotes in the Pratchett books are literally laugh out loud funny, um, which will get stares from people if you're on public transport. Um, and again, they can't do that. You can't you can't stop a bit of dialogue to insert a footnote in a film no. um, or TV show. Uh, and so it, it falls down that way. He's a brutal piece of kit. I will say, he, I think they've taken the lead out of these now, um, but he still weighs a metric ton. Also, none of these come with the resin bases. Those Mike are the Watts micro sell cobblestone do. street resin bases and they work yeah. perfectly for Discworld, so you can get them in the relevant sizes. The interesting thing is none of these are made for a specific game. They are just there Pretty to be had. Um, That's great. Which has never stopped me in the past because I looked but at the, these and I went, you know what I could do? I, I could play Frostgrave with these. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Who the way, the, the way that I see these really nicely is that like you read something like Guards, Guards, and you pick up these miniatures at the same time, mm-hmm. or like a couple of chapters into the book or whatever. And then you sit down and you're like, I'm going to paint these while I'm reading it or listening to an audio book or something like that. And I think it adds another layer to the kind of hobby of uh, and, and and what you're doing with Discworld mm-hmm. at that time. I think it's really cool. Oh, so it's nice. a new layer on hobby. Everybody's now. favorite yeah. wizard, the librarian. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you could transpose these into seven TV just because you could yeah, have you could do that as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, the the yeah. way it runs, it could run more similarly to the book because you could have those those yeah. pause moments, that end of a chapter, a little bit. <laughs> what's what's nice about a lot of the stuff that we see here now, and especially the way that games are going at the moment, is they're shifting towards this idea of and it's obviously not a massively new thing, but it's a lot a newer thing within the mainstream. It's this idea of very narratively driven skirmish games yes. and that kind of thing, tabletop games. And so looking at ranges like this and they enables you to sort of embrace that a little bit more, especially with something that's very familiar to a lot of people. Uh, so rather than just coming up with something, you know, completely new within the fantasy world, you're using something as a keystone almost to sort of like take that next step. Oh, no, the chest. Oh, my that's God. The, the luggage. Like luggage, so luggage. All the feet. All, <laughs> all the, the feet. That's what happens when you have sap in pear, would you say? All, all I can hear is Eric Idle's voiceover version of Rincewind in my head now. It was, it was it was an excellent um, yeah. computer game. <laughs> if you can find that as well, get an yeah. emulator and play that. The the, the point and click this world games are amazing. So the, what, what were they on? They were on PC were years PC, and years and years yeah. ago. Uh, but you'd have to so you'd have to find them with like DOSBox or something. Now. Mm. Oh wow! Okay, old school. <laughs> Amazing music as well. And again, yeah. the weird and wackiness of the. I completely forgot. Actually, technically, there's four sets because there's the death. Yeah, there's all the variants of death. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, yeah. so there, there are four streams through Discworld, and then the standalone books would be the fifth. Yeah. And you can buy them. No, pinted. don't go slow, machine. <laughs> How dare you? Why you go slow, Discworld thing? There we go. <laughs> no. Oh, no. Oh, I've broken <laughs> eyes. <laughs> Oops, it says no. Jerry's enthusiasm has crashed my crowd's uh, website. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's try this one at a time then. So unfortunately, I have broken the Micro Arts Studio website. Uh, which I'm very sorry. <laughs> Hopefully you'll get that sorted. You have drained all of its internet. Yeah, you know. Anyway, uh, as I was saying, there are the deaths. And these spring up from a variety of places. Um, oh. That's um, good. But every everyone comes from one of the, the books. So they're not just strange, unusual things that have been pulled forth from the backside of someone. Yes. You know. If he if he was to turn around, I don't this is the only problem with not having micro arts. We don't have the three sixties. He does have right. the born to rune studded on the back because he takes <laughs> that he takes that leather jacket off the dean. Uh, if people remember correctly in uh, soul music. Mm. It does seem like a lovely set that you can have a lot of fun with. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, yeah. One of the nice things about the miniatures as well is that obviously it, it ties into that sort of larger than life element that you get with Discworld, where like features are ex- accentuated and that kind of thing. So you can play around with your paints and 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 washes and highlights in a nice way, to try and like bring out the character in these miniatures very very well. I think so. Am I seeing that you can pick up swag from this website as well? Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean obviously it's the Discworld website yeah. so you can get everything you could ever want for Discworld to be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah, so. T-shirts. <laughs> artwork. You can get actually original artwork as well. That's if, cool. if, if you're quick. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, I will re- say, and reproductions which are much cheaper. I will say I have, I have my own little bit of Terry Pratchett memorabilia as well. Um, we went to the Hay on Y festival years and years ago when I was a, a wee lad. And he was there, and my dad vanished off into the crowd. Uh, and we were like, where's, where's Dad going? I don't know. And he came back with a Discworld map, and on it, Terry Pratchett had signed it and put, you are here. There we go. So that was very nice. nice. <laughs> I mean, if the That's maps lovely. are still out there, so you've got the map yeah. of like more pork, and you've got Discworld map itself, obviously, the whole disc. Um, yeah. I think they did one other, the Rambler Guide to the Ram Tops. Oh, right. Uh, yeah. Which is Lanker and the surrounding areas like Badass. Very cool. <laughs> which means if you get those, there were Discworld RPGs. Yeah. I don't think they're in print anymore. 
But again, that's all Paul They're could be there. artwork throughout mm. those. They're not only out there, they're also down there. <laughs> Very hard memory. <laughs> <thing. by all. laughs> There's no way it was. Absolutely by. everything. But uh, it's really, oh, that's it's a nice. sensational set of miniatures. I think for any Pratchett fan, like I say, Ooh. if you're just into regular fantasy, these are probably going to be a little bit bigger than your average. However, you know, making a, a seven TV set or a Frostgrave warband using the, the wizards or the witches um, is all very doable. Poor Magrat. <laughs> it would also be incredibly Discworldian, I guess, yeah. for you to play, dive into something like Frostgrave where you have just a wizard who doesn't care about the people that he's brought with him. He just wants to find the books. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So when all so his underlings you, die, well, that's just a day on the job. So, <laughs> so you, you mean like just the way I play regularly? Yes. So all, all the plebs yeah. can well, go away and die in a corner. Exactly. I have the treasure. I'm getting off the board. <laughs> oh, Pleb, you picked up treasure. Now you're important. It's the uh, most deadly cat known to man. Grebo. Even Green she bow. bears go round Green very carefully. Alice. Good old Grebo. Front of the opera. And where the series ended. With Tiffany Aiken. Again, because Terry wrote... Um, Non Discworld books as well. Um, so he did the, the young adult stuff, the, the borrowers, and, and Johnny and the Bomb, yeah. Johnny and the Dead. And yeah. then he also did some young adult Discworld books, but because they were Discworld books, Discworld fans bought them. Um, <laughs> and it turned out Terry's idea for writing for young adults is just to write as if he was writing for adults. <laughs> so, you know, and uh, marked it differently. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure that wasn't his it. choice. I'm yeah. sure that was a publisher going, Terry, we need we need something for the young adults. All right, well, here's one that I've recently written that I'll do for them. All right, we'll, we'll market it to them, and nobody cared. <laughs> but uh, it's it's a good way of doing it. Don't dumb down your writing for mm. younger people. There's the wizards. Now let's see what we would have seen if I hadn't killed. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't get an eight, the micro arts JDA yet. Yeah. No. If he looks familiar, that's because I scratch built him out of the Frostgrave plastic sets yep, for the yeah. Frostgrave game. Uh, yeah. and, and even painted them in the equivalent colors. I remember this. The tip of his hat contains brandy. <laughs> really? Yep. And the flaps at the side extend with poles to turn that into a one man tent if things get really bad. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Next to be out hunting. God, I love absurdism. Oh, yeah. Yes. And it, I mean, <laughs> wow. things that things that started as maybe a one line joke in a book develop. Mm. So Ponder is the youngest member of the faculty staff. And that is because he accidentally knocked ink all over his paper. One of the other wizards hadn't turned up and there'd been a deliberate subplot to force that wizard to pass. So there was only one question, which is, what is your name? <laughs> so Ponder moved across, done that. That was just in moving pictures. Ponder wasn't even really a recurring character. That's the end of <laughs> were. And then later on, it was like, he got 100% youngest faculty member ever. And then <laughs> he, he, he started doing whole heaps of stuff. So sometimes That's you surprising. wonder how much Terry thought in advance and how much was just pure yeah. blind luck of you know something that, that was recalled, like um, J.O. Cassandunda. Yeah. World's second greatest lover. That was another one line <laughs> joke, spelled slightly differently um, in Not Lords and Ladies. Uh, oh, can't remember what book it is now. It's old age, catch me up. But yeah, one line joke in the middle of that. And then years later, he appeared as an actual character. Um, Brilliant. Step ladders repaired. The thing that's quite nice about this when you think about it like you know how often we talk about miniatures and we're like oh it'd be nice to know kind of like a little bit of backstory to them and mm. sometimes Wait. companies will write that obviously yeah. all of these have that so yeah. which, which is just always nice to see yeah but it's how do they pick who they want to do from the world exactly yeah well do everyone 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 would be <laughs> the best way to do it um <laughs> gonna close those these are the most recent editions so the gods have appeared uh, however, these are limited and larger scale. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how large that larger scale is because they're not that much more expensive. So I'm thinking possibly just bigger than carrot sized. Well, that base is 30 mil. So there's your scale reference. Yeah, but you know, it doesn't always help me. 
You often Ooh. find you often find that whenever micro uh, are at events and stuff like that. By the way, you, they will have this range with them. So yeah. as as things are opening up in terms of events, and you know maybe you don't want to pay shipping or whatever, you'll be able to pick up a lot of this stuff at events if you don't want to get it online, which is cool. So is this quite an old range? This one been around no, for a I few mean, years now. The, yeah, the so. gods, the gods were only released this year. That's brilliant. Uh, so they, they are still yeah. doing stuff, and that one I hadn't seen before, and will be buying as death, soon as death we of rats. come off here because it's death <laughs> with death of rats. Yeah. So, so it's still getting updated. Yeah. Regardless of, as, I'm not sure how much of it will be. Oh, very far oh, away. Oh, tiny. Um, death in retreat. <laughs> there he is. There's the death. There's the death of rats just tucked in behind. So his good. Head. So good. That's really cute. Uh, yeah. So it's it's still being updated. But I don't know how often, because obviously there's a finite amount of stuff that Paul has drawn. Mm. Um, I don't know if he's still doing any more. I know that they've uh, uh, sort of built on the, because obviously these are the full miniatures in sort of like mm. that 30-ish mil scale. They've also done a series of busts recently yes. um, oh. for various characters and things. So if you just want to paint and you don't care about the potential for them to be used in games and that kind of thing. Then they have a bust collection as well over that's on their nice. website, which uh, Jerry has broken. So that's, that's I fun. have <laughs> killed it. Can make it on here as well, Lucy. So don't worry. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. It's definitely an interesting thing, and definitely cool for anyone that wants to collect stuff and is a fan of the disc world. And yeah. I mean, so. even if you're not a miniatures gamer, being able to have these, and I saw on the micro art site, you can buy them already painted. Fine, is expensive. <laughs> but if you are not a painter and you want it to like sit on top. yourself and just have oh, a yeah. tiny rinse wind looking at you and just, you know, yeah. quoting lines. I don't know lines, so I won't put lines. Or they this kind might of had be... to paint gotcha. them in the end. Um because so many people, Discworld fans, seen them on the site mm-hmm. uh, and then we're going, it's arrived and it's it's shiny yeah. tin and it yeah. hits. And what, yeah, what even, though, it? even though I had it miniatures displayed unpainted not assembled yeah 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 um people oh, no, still we, look past that so they've got to the we, point where they actually have a um yeah uh somebody does commission painting on the site going oh, out that's asking, brilliant. yeah you know, it may yeah. be a bit cheaper than getting the professionally yeah. done ones from micro arts in the lovely boxes mm-hmm. yeah we it actually might. had that happen in the store one time someone came in and bought a box lord of the rings took it home and brought it back on why why is it all in bits why is it all gray plastic that's not what the box showed me and it was just like they, they are miniatures in the oh. Require assembly. This might be the chance. If you've been looking at board games and card games and you've been looking to get into miniatures, this might be the way of doing it. So, yeah, very much so. If you are a fan of uh, Terry Pratchett, um, it's a nice excuse because you're already updated with all of the lore and backstory. If you're so, way it's working. Oh, did you fix it, Jerry? Yep. yep. Did you offer it a candy bar? Exactly I find right. that I find that works with computers when they don't work. Offer it candy, it works. <laughs> Perfect for Halloween as well. We'll give it a kick. They're also interesting if people have because there were a few Discworld board games out there as well. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if They're you nice, have yeah. those, then you could possibly replace the uh, the player token. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That could be cool. I have, I have the Ankh Ank- Ank- Morpork board game sitting on my shelf, even though that's been. Redone as something else now, but uh, yeah. oh, very cool. King, I think. Nanty Narking, yeah. the new one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah very yeah. awesome stuff there, Jerry. Lovely. I, oh, I feel I'm more, full of whimsy now. No. It's so I know. The only <laughs> thing I, do, I don't own the gods, and I don't own that Death with Rats, so that may be oh, my present to me. How long <laughs> you do own them, then, Jerry? I'm going to guess oh, the 13th no. of next month when we're at Salute. Oh, oh no, I just ordered them now. <laughs> I'm not winning. <laughs> then you can have that wonderful buyer experience of I want it and I have it in my hand and I can take it home and it's mine forever. Or you can yeah, get it I'll, now. I'll, I'll get it now. Yeah, I guess. He just says that to the, the he just says that to the postman instead. That's the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it, no, it means when he's at salute, he can buy other things. Mm. That's true. Yeah. That is true. But there we have it. A fantastic indie of the week. A little bit different. Mm. Um, don't know if there are many other IPs out there that have. Mm actually produced their miniatures. I'm not talking about the big ones like Star Wars or whatever, but with things, things like stuff, yeah. I'd like Dred- to see Dresden a Northern Light. And stuff like that. Yeah. I'd like to see Chronicles of Pern. That'd be good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A bit of Philip Pullman miniatures would be quite nice for me. A bit of Northern Lights, yeah. I'm replete already. They've done Deskworld. I'm quitting. <laughs> oh, don't My work here is done. 
you are satisfied. I'd, I'd give it till next year, and I imagine Wheel of Time will start to invade tabletops everywhere. Oh, Probably. yeah. yeah. I'm, so, I'm laying odds you will see a board game, game well. first. Uh, well, you know, you could do. Could do. <laughs> Massed armies slamming into each other. But let us know what you think of the Disc World Below, folks. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll be diving straight into the news. Coming to you from the center of Northwestern Europe. Covering board games, war games, card games, and all that sh- you love. It's the Muck f- News. <laughs> so we are back, and we're going to be looking at some fantastic news from across the tabletop world. Um, we are starting off with a little bit of hobby stuff at the moment, uh, because the Army Painter have announced that they're going to be launching a new range of paints next year in 2022. Mm. Um, so for all those board gamers out there and those of you that just want to get to paint on miniatures so that they meet the minimum requirements for a tournament, Hello. Colors up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're going to be launching the Speed Paint range. Uh, so the Speed Paint range uh, is basically designed so that you can get your miniatures done in minutes. Um, the miniature that is actually shown off here in this video that you're seeing at the moment, this behind the scenes look, took, took less time than the video took to watch to paint, uh, which basically shows you what you can do with these paints and how you can mm-hmm. sort of bring things to the tabletop very nice and quickly. Um, if you've seen things like contrast, then these are sort of in the same vein of paint, although obviously they'll have that kind of like patented army painter twist. Um, army painter have always very much been the kind of company that have focused on the idea of painting things quickly so that you can game with them more. Uh, and so I would imagine they've put a lot of thought and effort into bringing this paint range to the tabletop. Uh, and it certainly looks very nice, very vibrant, um, allows you to sort of get that really nice um, sort of tonal change between in the miniatures, as you can see there with the greens and the reds that they're showing off there as well. So uh, as I say, coming in 2022, uh, it'll be very, very interesting to have a play around with these. I'd like to see uh, perhaps John get his hands on some to see what they're like. Um, uh, but yeah, looks very cool. Something to sort of add to your arsenal of paints. Uh, the one thing I was going to say, and I mentioned it in the news article as well, mm-hmm. is that um, paints like contrast, for example, uh, they they are they've become almost uh, a tool within the armory that is just painting in general now yeah. uh, so you don't just have to paint an entire army in contrast and that's the way you have to paint it a lot of people are using contrast for sort of alongside their traditional painting uh, techniques in order to get some very fascinating results on the tabletop mm-hmm. uh, for their miniatures so i'll be eager to see how these work uh, there's going to be a starter set and a mega set that are coming out uh, so watch out for that i would imagine it'll be the sort of earlier period of 2022 so mm-hmm. So It'll be fascinating I, to see how it goes. I was talking to John about these, and he says one of the biggest things he's hearing about it is is the consistency of coverage you're going to get with these paints. Because you'll know some right. of the contrast paints, some of them they'll go down, they'll go into the thing really well. You've got your shadows, you've got your light bits, you've got your midtones. Some of them don't do it as well, and some of them are like stupidly thick, and you have to thin them down. So I think what I'm hearing is the army painter are trying to make it like a nice level playing field Even. where every paint is going to give you that that same level of coverage so you get the same result every time regardless of colour. That would be nice. Yeah, yeah it'll be fascinating yeah, to see how, how they pull it off. Uh, there are some out in the wild that have been sent off to people to have a look at. But yeah, if memory I, serves, it's the same three colours that everybody's received. So whether they're just the first batch off the line mm. or they're the most consistent. Maybe, maybe. The it'd cynic be interesting. in me, I don't know. That- that video, the kind of like when I when I paint with contrast, as it were, I use a small brush because I don't like with contrast. I find there's so much pooling if you're mm. not careful enough. That the video they just saw that was quite a big brush with quite a lot of paint on it as well. Yeah. So it'd be quite interesting yeah. to see how the, I the way, way that the way that I've seen a lot of people using contrast, and I would assume would be the way to use the speed paint is to kind of get it onto the model and then move it around so you don't you avoid the pooling issues and things like yeah. that. But as Justin yes. was saying, there is issues with coverage. Because, mm-hmm. for example, I, I use two for my I and then Eldar stuff. The yellow goes on with very, one thin, relatively thin coat, and that's fine. The blue takes like two good coats mm-hmm. in order to get a bit of coverage to it. But uh, as I say, it's another tool in the armory. Yeah. So. It'll, be, yeah. it'll, it'll be fascinating when it hits retail. We'll see exactly uh, how it performs and also I, how yeah. it uh, contrasts to the yeah. current paint contrast. range because no no i don't care about contrast <laughs> staying within the army painter family because their sprays match the bottles yeah and 
the uh, the washes and tones. Everything is is within that family works together and are the same color. So if you get a spray that's red, uh, specifically like chaotic red, it matches the paint out of the pot. Yeah. Um, and I I wonder if this will be something similar again, where they they've picked specific paints within their range, and these are and then sort of a complement to it. Kind of. Yeah, complementary yeah. or a, a, like a mid tone. So if you would normally paint with orc flesh, mm. then will this be the mid tone version of orc flesh with highlight and shade on either side of it? That that type of thing. So yeah, it but, might be a case where they go with those neutral colors, like what Workshop <laughs> did. So you've got the the bone and the gray. So you might have that no. sort of two tone. No, it's it's, again. it's straight on white primer and not even a stupid white primer. Wow. regular mm. white primer. Go yeah. to Halfords. Bam, done. Yeah, no. yeah, but changing those does change how those. Oh yeah, uh, work. you know your so base coat will see how your that base coat will change it. But they they it literally says inside the pots that I've seen. Um, Go straight over white a matte white primer, so it's okay. not going. You need to have a stupid special, extra <laughs> special primer. Yeah, these are just out of the bottle goo. Um, so mm-hmm. whatever white you oh. happen to have, she'll do the job. And I imagine zeniths and the like underneath will, yeah. will work on it. But oh, yeah, also, fascinating. They, they also mentioned that it works well through airbrushes and things like that. They oh, they mentioned that as an idea. So that's uh, another possibility for you to go with with that. That's but, fact yeah. there. Time will tell. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Where to uh, next, Ben? So uh, next up, we're introducing dinosaurs because who doesn't love dinosaurs? I certainly love dinosaurs. I had all the dinosaur comics when I was at, not comics, magazines when I was a kid. They came in a big red binder. Oh, I got a glow-in-the-dark uh, skeleton. That was great. But anyway, uh, now for real grown-up dinosaurs, but not really. But anyway, uh, <laughs> the Wadron Apex Predator is now available for you to uh, snap up from the Parabellum War Games uh, web store. And also you could find it on store.teletop.com very soon as well. <laughs> I love that it's feathered. Oh, yes. Because yeah, that's traditionally dinosaur which is pretty yeah. cool because they would have had feathers. Um, so this is a absolutely huge miniature, as you can see. All of the miniatures in the uh, Conquest range are 35 millimeter anyway. And so yeah. when you take that into account with the rider on the back of it, this is a big, chonking apex predator. Uh, he's still got little hands, though, but, you know, it wouldn't be a T-Rex you without know. them. Uh, and, yeah, an absolutely stunning miniature uh, from... Um, from top to bottom and from mm. front to back. And I think you'll have a really uh, good time painting up one of these. You can also pick up an alternative miniature to go on the top of it. So if you don't want the Apex Predator, you can get the Apex Queen instead, which is a variant model based on one of the uh, ones that already exists within the Wadron uh, sort of like selection uh, over on their web store. Yeah. Uh, Talking of uh, sort of like quick paints and that kind of thing and contrast paints, this would be one that would be pretty damn perfect for those because all that sort of blending on the feathers would work very, very nicely with speed paints. And all of the the scaly sculpted detail in there as well. It's just going to sit in those recesses and just give you a really nice effect really quickly. I love the fact that he's also got like a scar on his face. Mm -hmm. I saw that, yeah. T-Rex. Yeah. Yeah. Mouth. Clearly Shot down on someone with a blade. Clearly (laughs) clearly what's happened there is somebody's punched him. Hit yeah. dig, split his lip. And that's why you should always box T-Rex, because they don't have the reach. <laughs> they leave themselves wide open. Bam. It, was, no. it wasn't going to be another T-Rex that's punched him at least. <laughs> no, no that's, that's why Kong wings. Um, I think they come later on this month. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Which will be interesting. I know early in November, I'll be speaking to Leo from Parabellum, and uh, myself and Leo will be going through and doing the Path of Conquest for the Wadroon. Oh, uh, so if people yeah. have already got an army or maybe they've been waiting for a chance to dive in, uh, then they can definitely do that with the Wadroon sometime later in the year. Uh, so yeah. we're not sure when those are, are going to sort of hit the website. But uh, mm. yeah, it'll be fascinating to do another one because I quite like the spires. Mm. But who doesn't like orcs on the back of dinosaurs? Exactly. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, next up we're going to be moving on to a little bit of historical stuff because uh, Friesen tells about purple haze. Mm-hmm, from there, yeah. Yep. So there has I, been a very, <laughs> there has been a very, very exciting announcement from Phalanx with purple haze. As Ben just said, so it's not a board game rendition of Jimi Hendrix Experience, and it's Aww. not a print spin off of how that purple rain does settle. It's not one of them. <laughs> um, it's uh, players are going to head into an immersive experience, a story creation game, and one to six players cooperate to survive dangers and the sinister atmosphere of Vietnam in 1967. So mm. players travel and lead their marines across a jungle 
evolved through flooded rice paddies and into the iconic bamboo villages of the war-torn country. So each mission requires intelligence because players need to make heavyweighted decisions. Each outcome is going to affect the way that your story lands. So whether that ends in death for all of your men, you're going to need to determine whether you really have got the skills to survive what it takes. So it's not just story as well that players focus on too. In part, it's got tactical combat side as well as you journey through the main campaign. So Phalanx have promised much suffering and the chance that (laughs) all of your men will not make it back, including yourself. So the story develops in difficulty, meaning all players have got to adapt to the surroundings or face death in both yourself and your squad winning the game pretty simple complete the mission come back get out of life (laughs) yeah so it's really interesting it it does sound but it's currently in development that that one of those is in that at the moment Mm -hmm. um but if you do go over onto phalanx you can see that this play it's going over to game found um Mm -hmm. and if you do follow the announcement you can get yourself a cheeky five dollars off if you are keen so you can expect more updates coming um from phalanx for now but uh yeah it's quite an exciting premise this one especially combining the tactical Mm. and the storytelling uh during vietnam war I'm just Very getting nice. waves of we were soldiers. You know, where's Mel Gibson when you need him? <laughs> Not making films anymore. No, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So this one looks really cool. I really like the look at this. I, I like yeah. that it said so you've got like kind of like 90 minutes for a sort of a game, and then there's like 720 minutes you said for like going through the campaign of that all, yeah. which sounds really awesome. Yeah. Um, and Phalanx have been doing really awesome stuff when it comes to kind of like blending together sort of board games and history yeah. uh, over the last sort of few months, years, and things was like it that. So, yeah. Coalitions, you really enjoyed, was it? Is mm. it was it Coalitions? Coalitions, we, the uh, Napoleonic coalitions. game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. The, the I, one for me was U Boat. U Boat was very cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I know John had a lot of fun with that one. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's the fact that no two games uh, tend to be the same, they mm. rarely use the same engine. Uh, twice in most cases they are they're looking for interesting games and interesting ways to tell a, a specific conflict or a, a yeah something on yeah. the tabletop so whether it happens to be a vietnam game like this or a napoleonic um te- technically it's napoleonic warfare but actually it's about the the alliances that form and break throughout that period instead you know they're they're always looking for innovative ways and creators go to them because their their catalog shows this and at the same time then the production is is generally top notch i mean oh, i quite like yeah. the fact that they've gone with the i suppose the the historically accurate military maps for vietnam for the actual counter movement as well and i see it's one to six players so you can play through it solo yes. which is fascinating i will say yeah. if, if if that game has caught your eye and as jerry was saying about the production value there is a game coming next year called bread valder which is based around the Anglo-Saxons. Oh, yes. oh my days. <laughs> I saw, we saw the production version of, well, the sort of like test version of that at UK Games Expo. I think I'm already in love. Um, oh. But yeah, if you like Anglo-Saxons in the Dark Ages, it is amazing. They, they why do we always end up in the bar? Yeah, why do we all, they always end up going back to the Dark Ages? Because it's best it's the ages. Best. <laughs> Dark ages are best ages. You should. It's a, it's a time when history and myth melded together to create an amazing <laughs> melting pot of awesomeness. So yeah, it really a, is. A mythy thing. Yeah. Anyway, shall we, we, to, shall we move backwards in time away from the yes. Vietnam War? Mm, so uh, we're heading back to World War II with the next news story uh, because Battlefront have now, well, are in the process of releasing all of their Romanians for the continuing efforts on the Eastern Front for Flames of War in 15mm. Uh, they're getting a new um, source book, the Brave Romania book, uh, which charts the progress of the armies on the Eastern Front as they helped the Germans fight against the Soviets in the sort of... Uh, attack against Stalingrad and such. So you'll be following the path of the sort of two armies that sort of split up and worked alongside the flanks of the German army mm-hmm. up towards Stalingrad and all the sort of battles that came alongside that, which sounds pretty cool. Um, you're also going to get a whole bunch of new miniatures to play around with. Uh, so you've got a new rifle platoon. You're also going to get machine guns and mortars to um, watch over them as well. 
uh, fun thing with the sort of like the, the infantry that you get for the Romanians is that they have the peasant army special rule. Mm. Uh, so you get to make a dice roll when you're using these at the start of the game to see mm-hmm. if you can boost their morale, which is pretty cool. <laughs> uh, probably, probably necessary. Yes. There's probably, a, it, it helps even more if there's a German officer watching from a hill. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Boosting something. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so yeah, as I say, you've got the rifle platoon there, the machine guns, the mortars. The book itself isn't just a sort of guide to building your army. It also comes with loads of historical nuggets as well. So if you really want to snap up something for the Romanians and players, one of the, I guess you'd say, lesser known additions to the Axis, <laughs> then you can definitely do that. They're also providing a set of sort of direct only stuff from Battlefront, which allows you to pick up some artillery pieces. You get some more vehicles as well. And you've also got those cavalry options as well. Oh, that the, uh, yeah. Romanians threw into the mix too. Um, so yes, lots more stuff happening on the Eastern Front for World War II, which is very cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people will be picking those up as the Axis allies, as they're known, as yeah. part of that source book that came out not too far, not too long ago so yeah very it's cool. interesting you often get people they won't um they won't want to play the sort of the german army mm-hmm. itself but in playing one of the the allies for the axis so you've got your your hungarians romanians uh, whatever it happens to be Finns, even um they offer a very different take on the yeah. type of army yeah. you're going to field and how they performed in the field as well mm-hmm. uh, and also occasionally will throw up unusual little vehicles so whether it's their own version of of german sort of armor or um reconstituted early war vehicles that they've uh, had to browbeat and, and up gun and push back into service <laughs> so it's it's not by any means the the sort of the easy option um, when you're playing, you can you can find yourself reaching for something that you would expect to see in the German toolbox, and it's just not there. So, yeah, I think it's a really fascinating way of playing it from that perspective. Hmm. Because even if you play someone as well known as the Italians, who are an ally, obviously yeah. of, the, of the Germans, you're again fighting with a force that is severely under under so underpowered compared to the German war machine at the time, yeah. and it does provide you with a very different sort of tactical outlook on how you play your games. So. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Stunning Born. stuff from the mm-hmm. Romanians. Shall we take a look at something borderlining the Dark Ages? We're going oh, back even I, further. Yeah. I knew it was Go coming. Back in. Had to be there. <laughs> For example, shall we take Saga? Yeah. <laughs> the Age of Invasions what? is finally available to order. Uh, should have been out already, then somebody stole all the paper. <laughs> um, so it was due out in September and uh, there was a massive paper shortage and uh, they had to delay publication, which is outrageous. So uh, Saga Age of Invasions is uh, the latest universe book uh, for Saga. So you need a copy of the core Saga rules for it. However, this brings things into the fall of the Roman Empire. So that sort of window of 200 years, so 300 to oh. 500 Ish, uh, and in it, they have eight new battle boards. Um, so you'll be able to play off as the late Romans, the Huns, the Goths, Britons, Saxons, Picts, Franks, and Sassanids. Bit of everything, which is exciting. Um, it's exciting for me. This <laughs> Atius and Arthur was the last of the first edition books, but mm-hmm. also the prototype slash first book for um, second edition. So a lot of a lot of what is in this is a new version of what we've seen with Atius and Arthur, um, but sort of revised after a few years of other books being out there. However, when they did it, the Franks were in the book. But you had to go and get the Frank Battleboard from another earlier first edition book. Mm. Right. Fascinids weren't in it at all. Uh, so if you want to do the um, Sassanid and Byzantine sort of fighting that happens around the, the sort of mid to late 400s, you couldn't do that either. Um, which obviously, when you're playing the fall of Rome, it fell. But then the you know Eastern Empire became Rome and then became the, the Byzantine. So being able to actually have the conflicts that they should have had makes sense. And also then because they brought the Sassanids in to push up against the Romans, then that means you can also throw the Sassanids against the Goths and the like as well. And the Huns, because there was obviously conflicts there as they were attempting to expand um, the sort of the the Middle East. 
So fascinating to see where they're going to go with it. Mm. They've said that obviously it contains those eight battle boards, but there will be variation lists in there as well, which I think pushes it up to 12. Uh, so I imagine the Picts will get the the Irish Scotty version again. Um, but once again, because they borrowed those battle boards from previous editions, this time around there is a new second edition Irish battle board. So I don't know if it will be just a, a variation on the Pictish board or if Irish players will be able to transplant that in and change up how they're Irish play uh, 300 years prior to uh, the age of Vikings. There's also um, a two-player campaign system in it, which is nice. the Limes campaign system, which they had in the last one. And I don't know if it's changing, and I hope it's not, because it was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> it was a, a two-player campaign system where one player is supposed to play the Romans and then somebody else is playing the barbarians knocking at the doors. Oh, cool. Played over six uh, years, so each game turn is a year. You both start with like a, a 10 morale, and then over the years that can drop. Um, but the way, the way it was constructed was fascinating because the Roman player were nearly always the defenders, and they started with six points, which for Saga is a, a good size force. The Barbarian player starts with four and are always up against it. But because they're always up against it, they have a, a phase where they would recruit or get stratagems or um, build forces or, or look for a war. Yeah, okay. And every year that reset. So every year they got they went back to four points and went up again because they could recruit extra people in and change how the war band worked. So they had the off season to campaign, okay. uh, to recruit and bring people in. Then the Romans in response started at that six points and that six points would kind of drop over time. They could recruit people, but to recruit people, they would have to, you know, send away for uh, recruits to come in. They would have to build barracks. They would have to do all these things. Uh, and that came down to how much time the barbarian player spent because you don't tell <laughs> right, the Roman yeah. what's going on. You <laughs> just went, I've spent four time units. It's just a yeah. world of a scale. And, and that four time units could be to recruit, 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 recruit or to go and send for a warrior uh, to become a new warlord. or So you don't know what's happened. All you know is the thaw has come and you were expecting an early attack from the barbarians, but they haven't arrived. And then maybe in the middle of summer, they suddenly appear. And the time that you've had to build your defenses or recruit or bring in horsemen or whatever was obviously there. Uh, so it was a fascinating way of playing. It sounds very dynamic. Yeah. A very dynamic narrative campaign, and it worked really well for the Romans uh, being sort of assaulted on all sides. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully it remains pretty much intact. I don't think it actually needed to be changed in any way, shape, or form. Uh, it worked really well as a solid campaign system. And the fact it was a two-player means that you're not having to worry about getting a club together and making sure that six, seven, eight people stuck around and played <laughs> all the games every week, which is often the death. The great of dilemma. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, if Jerry. If you your friend want to play, <laughs> then you can just get down and you can play out these, these intricate, long-ranging sort of games as Rome gets assailed on all sides. Uh, so, yeah, Saga the Age of Invasions is on its way. I know when it first cropped up a few months ago, I'm going... I don't know if I'll bother. I've got Eddie and Arthur, and it covers kind of the same things. And now I'm looking at going, mm, I might actually, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, one you know, copy for you, one copy for Lloyd, and then uh, fish, yeah. fish bite hooks. Yeah. That's, uh, I that's mean, what I'm eventually you're going to have to get back to kicking his toys in. Very oh, true. Yeah. Always, yeah. always. And whether or not that happens with uh, the fall of Rome or the Dark Ages, time will tell. Mm -hmm. But away from history and having a look at something weird. Oh, having a look at something weird. So, as you know, I just need to figure out how many times I say spooky season this month, but spooky season's <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> although most of you lot are probably kind of looking at all of the stuff that's out at the moment, so there is the Rotten Harvest bits that's going on, and there's a massive painting competition going over at Weird. There's still loads going on. So, quite a lot of people got a look into Gen Con, having a loads of new stuff, getting pre-release, but there is some new stuff. So Malifaux Burns is coming this month. Then Malifaux Burns is really, really interesting because it seems that Malifaux is developing more. It's not so stuck into factions as much as it used to be now. You can switch and change, and all of the core boxes that are coming out have certain different faction labels on it. So 
now you've got no problem getting a crew together, no problem putting in masters because the titles will add differences and switching and changing. There is so much customization coming to the game that some characters, you will get a new lease of life in playing them as well with their new titles. There's lots of fun stuff coming out with Malifaux Benz. Along with that, you've got two boxes that are jam-packed with your masters that you need, A Realm Beyond, as well as Remade and Reforged. And if you are looking at other weird titles, um, the other side has just had one hell of a revive, shall we say, um, with the two-player starter set that's just recently come out at Gen Con. Uh, we've got some new masters coming in as well. So Samantha Thrace um, is coming and uh, his name, why can I not remember his name? My bad. Uh, Samantha Thrace and Bing Nugan. I, I, please tell me the correct way. So his name is B-I-N-H-N-G-U-Y-E-N. So if you can say that, please. Sounds please about right. Him. Bing Nugan. Bing. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. they put out a Morton Joe is alive and well. <laughs> <the other> yeah. side. <laughs> Somebody needs to stop him before he takes Wearing all the water. Wearing some steampunk uh, Iron yeah. Man or something. Yeah, yeah exactly. He Every, will point, everything's okay. black and enamelled. Yeah. I will point out, if you if you scroll through to the people with the shocking lightning in their fingers, do you oh. see that? See if you oh, can yeah. find those? Uh, I think it's in that warband. Yeah. Because uh, uh, I, I hope everyone uh, is fully aware of how... Oh, wait, wait, wait. Before I, before I say this. Are the miniatures in this going to be the same as they are in some sets where they're all sort of like pre-assembled or are these ones you have to put together yourself? So the, usually the normal releases will come, not come pre-assembled, yeah. special in editions case, then, and the nightmare boxes. you well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because the, the, Manifo the, is fiddly, mate. <laughs> it, it looks like a good luck moment. Get yourself a helping hand. Exactly. Yes, but they, they they are. there's so much coming out this month as well. So you've got your new masters. And what's great with the other side is they have implemented the other side to be cross-compatible, that not all cool. of the boxes, yeah, yeah. Uh, with Malifaux. So not only have you got all of your Malifaux characters that you can now customise and add and grow, but you have the cards in the other size boxes that will allow you to use them in Malifaux as well. So nice. the world is getting bigger and bigger mm. and bigger. So uh, quite excited to see where Malifaux is going to go with Malifaux Burns because it is an expansion. So I can imagine not everybody's going to be immersed in kind of the new rule changes and see what people prefer and see how the community from Weird Moving the story separated. forward as well, I would imagine. Mm, so, so yeah, quite interesting coming from Weird. Oh, I'm all for it. You just need to break mm. out the McCabe's. <laughs> <laughs> I do love a bit of Malifaux. It's one of my, my favourite little skirmish games. I really I like really, the way that it comes together. Yeah, it's the fantasy aspect of Malifaux. It's, it's kind of similar in, uh, not similar in a way, but to Moonstone, the same kind of character, dark and gritty with cute and whimsical mm. combined in the same. I really like the aesthetic at Malifaux. Uh, yeah. But it seems like now a lot is changing at the moment. And if you, I would know that a lot of people have jumped off at second edition and want to get back into third. And with all of the changes that are going on in the minute, Malifaux Burns might be worth having a look at if you're looking at a new reason to get into the game. Yeah, nice. I've always enjoyed the aesthetic, but I'd never bothered going near the actual game itself. Um, I just never There's... never got around to actually seeing whether or not I wanted to play it. So I'm, I'm not even entirely certain how it plays. I mean, whenever I was playing, there was a really nice like cheating your fate mechanic that was built into the game. So you could sort of, if you got like a bit of bad luck, you could sort of edge things back towards where you wanted it to be, which I thought was a really cool mechanic. I don't know yeah. if that's still there or not. I was playing years ago. Yeah, the, the, the card mechanics are still in the mix. So you still have that deck of cards that you use, the fate deck, and you have a hand of cards as well that you can use to change fate, as you were saying they're just in. But everything's done on the flip of cards rather than dice, which is always yep. nice to see. Mm-hmm. So uh, I do love a bit of card play. Very nice. And obviously the miniatures are lovely. And yeah. you don't need that many of them to play the game either. So. Oh, I may need to relook at this. Yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> if it's been tickling your fancy for a while, perhaps mm-hmm. then third edition is the way to go for you. Mm-hmm. And jump on in and take a look at the weird side of things. Rounding out the news though, Ben. Yes, uh, we're running out the news with Lord Sigmar returning to the tabletop with some of his Stormcast Eternals. Uh, we move from having not very many miniatures on the tabletop to lots and lots of miniatures, Ooh, because of course you do in your big battle zone for Sigmar. Um, the Stormcast Eternals are getting basically all of their additional releases that they need in order to sort of round out the faction with all their new Thunderstrike armoured individuals. Uh, leading the way is possibly one of the most badass looking characters I've seen for Age of Sigmar yet, Lord Commander Bastian Carthalos. Uh, he comes, as you see there, with his meteoric great hammer, and he also has a different version of him, which comes with an alternative head with a big stylized beard on it. It looks very cool indeed. Very grungy, very uh, uh, Sigmar as well. Very nice. Looks kind of like Morgan Freeman. 
<laughs> he's been the president. Why can't he be the Lord Commander of the well, Stormcast yeah. Eternals? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> in addition uh, to Lord Commander Bastian Kothlos, you've also got the new Knight Relictor. So this is a step down from the Lord Relictor that we saw in the initial release of Age of Sigma, uh, but no less grim and dark. Uh, they like to sacrifice martyrs to the Lord himself and use that power to boost the abilities of their fellow Stormcasts. Who said they were the good guys, eh? (laughs) Uh, Exactly. Um, We also have a whole bunch of new units as well. So uh, these are ones that you will have seen before in some of the previews that Games Workshop has done. Uh, So we'll we'll race through these. But you have the Praetors there, which are your new sort of like bodyguards that you'll use alongside your characters. You also have the Annihilators, which get a new proper kit. Um, These are your big bad boys in heavy armour. Uh, not Terminators, of course. Uh, and you can obviously assemble these in different ways and take their helmets off. I prefer them with the helmets on myself. But Is, uh, yeah. is that a bear on his chest? Is that a bear on his chest? Yes, yes. it is a bear on his Yay! chest. Yay! Okay. Yeah. It's not all, it's not all uh, uh, lions and dragons. with uh, Yes, Sigma. and Adonis sculpted bodies. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> now, of course, if you're going to be making immortal warriors, you make them look as hot as possible. Oh, um, yeah. You also have some additional uh, miniatures, including the Vanquishers here, as you can see, which are kind of like your scouts that you're using on the tabletop with their flowing cloaks and things, running forward with swords at the ready. Uh, and then you obviously get loads of different options in this set to make them all with your helmets on or helmets off and different poses as well, which is nice. I like Again, how they've chose to keep the helmet on the horn blower. Yes. Out of all of the <laughs> figures you would think they would have the helmet off, it would be yeah. the one blowing a trumpet. Weird, weirdly enough, it's, when it's, it's, it's magical breath. <laughs> there was the horn miniature... knows when to sound. It goes near your lips. There was a miniature that came out in the initial release of the Stormcast Tunnels that did something exactly the same, Jerry. Mm-hmm. But then they re-sculpted his face so that he had a gap in his mask so that he could right. the horn. So there you go. Well, it's just a little spring-loaded flap that you just exactly. slot into. Just yeah. What if it gets stuck? Can you imagine him trying to just like pull the horn out of his mouth? Oh, it's it just like, sound, no. It'd sound like a penny whistle for the rest of his life. Oh, there you, go. <laughs> uh, you also have the Vigilors here, who are your sort of new bowmen. Uh, so if you don't want to run Judicators, you can run these. Again, going for that kind of like more lithe, uh, sort of look to the Stormcast Eternals here with more fitting armour, less big walking tanks, more heavily armoured sort of Greco-Roman style warriors, which is kind with of With cool. a Justin-style helm. Exactly. Yes, yeah. I, saw, I saw a couple of those. I mean, I have been immortalised once again. Right, once <laughs> yeah. uh, Literally in this case for this miniature. Very much so, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I actually really like these miniatures. I think they look really nice. Uh, it's cool to see them with the actual bowstrings on the bows as well. You don't get to mm. see that very often. Which is that cool. is a bit of a bugbear sometimes for me. Yeah. Uh, and then we finish things off with the Vindictors. Uh, so these are miniatures that you would have seen before available as part of the start sets and as part of Dominion. Uh, they now get a full kit so you can sort of customise and tweak things to suit your needs. Uh, obviously, like a lot of the new Games Workshop stuff, the sort of like main core of their bodies and things and their poses all goes together, but then you can kind of mix and match the different elements of that. So their heads and sort of accessories and that kind of thing as well. So it uh, gives you a few more things to play around with if you're playing as the Stormcast Eternals on the tabletop. Mm. Um, I will say that there are some more Uruks as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they did get a fairly big release a couple of weeks ago, uh, but they're now also getting the Man Skewer Bolt Boys, uh, which look uh, decidedly cunning and cruel, ready to pin a Stormcaster Tunnel down to the ground, no doubt, and drag them off into the swamps. Uh, you can't go back up to the heavens if you've been strapped up with chains, of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, also, yeah. we also have the Hobgrot Slithers, uh, who are your sort of uh, classic sort of hobgoblins reimagined for Age of Sigma in the Mortal Realms. Um, they carry with them those sort of cruel little daggers that they use for shanking people because you've got to do a bit of shanking. And then you've also got those little tiny things that look like maracas, but it in fact are grenades. Uh, so if you want to throw things at nice. the enemy and blow them up, you can do. Where did Hobgrots get grenades from? You, I hear you ask. Well, that's a little teaser for the Chaos Duarte, no doubt, coming around mm. the corner. So watch out for that. I want to see big hats. You've got to have big hats. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I, do, I think these days they may move away from the big hats. They probably will. <laughs> I, I, I think we're probably going to see a more um, Forge world. Yes, they'll version. probably look a lot more like the ones they did in Forge world towards the end of uh, the yeah. old world. Yeah. It's probably not a bad, bad thing, mind yeah. you. They'll get Ooh. a lot of fans. 
I will also say uh, that the Dracothians, so those massive big dragons that we saw previewed a couple of months yeah. ago, they are coming in December now. Uh, so they've been sort of moved back a little bit, but you'll be able to pick up your dragons just in time for Christmas. Because oh. what's more Christmassy than a dragon? Oh, so yes. oh. <laughs> I guess they like fires. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it, it pains me seeing these releases because this Saturday, waiting for me actually after, this Saturday I'll be getting hold of Harrow Deep where there's oh. plenty of Stormcraft, there's plenty of Eternals in there and there's all... I'm just seeing these now and I'm like, it's going to grow, isn't it? It's going to get worse. Yeah, yeah, here we go. Where is Kim? There's a reason we are <laughs> called plastic crack dealers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did. It was just Meeple before now, so here we go. Shocking, <laughs> Shocking altogether. Well, there you have it. Another jam-packed brief look at the news. There's obviously a lot more over on tabletop.com. Uh, so these are just some of the highlights we've picked out for this week. We're going to take a quick swish. And when we return, we'll be looking at some 3D printing. All right, folks, we're back. And we're going to be taking a look at some 3D printing printing mm. and what dwarves have you found for us this week ben <laughs> I, alas, oh, if it is alas there are no dwarves in, this oh, yay. in, fact, in fact one of the most deadly foes of all dwarves the oh. rat dun, dun, okay. dun. before we get into this then can i ask what have the pod people done with the real ben I mean, I was I was kind of Behind iffy when you you I was kind of iffy when you're wearing the the woolen sweater thing. It kind of oh, looks like a house coat. It's cold, and this is a cardigan. It's a nice <laughs> cardigan. Yeah, well, not even one dwarf. We're not even talking about one dwarf, Ben. Not a single bearded friend, no. Hmm. Uh, but this is resin warfare. Uh, who have a neat little selection of different bits and bobs, uh, mm -hmm. mainly to sort of focus around uh, what, we, what, I, what I said before. So you've got like your rat warriors, but in different styles. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking to build up some forces to use in mm -hmm. something like uh, Night Age, for example, uh, or you want to use them as alternatives in other fantasy war games, because many of them exist. Kings mm -hmm. of War. Kings of War. Yeah, you got your for that, you could use them in One Pages Rules is a fantasy game as well, and of course you could use them in Warhammer Fantasy and uh, Age of Sigma at the same time too. But this is a selection of twisted and weird and chaotic, strange rat creatures uh, that you can download and print off at home that look particularly gruesome and deadly. Uh, and I really like the sort of like wide range of bits and bobs we've got here. Um, because you have your kind of like standard rack and file troops, and then you have things like these, which are like these weird vermin riders. So they're sort of um, obviously rat warriors riding on the back of something they grew in the lab. <laughs> yeah. From okay. Older, oh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Who brought the dog? Because <laughs> when I seen those, I was thinking, oh, you could use those for hack paws uh, yeah. in Kings of War. Yeah. Um, and then I'm going, where where would I find a monster or a rat man to fill the back? Does he have any? And then no, lo and behold, there's already Hackpaw Cavalry in there. Mm -hmm. Hackpaw Cavalry, which are ridiculously fast people. If mm -hmm. your opponent is lining up rat kin opposite you, then uh, watch out for Hackpaws. Stay they right at the back of the battlefield. Filth. <laughs> Absolute filth. They are gorgeous as well with the yeah. they, they still look like, they fundamentally still look like rats, but they're not. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're stunning. Yeah, I mean, I not, guess they were just put in a hamster wheel when they were born and left there. Probably. They're now hench rats. That's the way forward, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the thing that's quite nice about these is that obviously you can see the examples of how they've come out printed, which is quite mm -hmm. nice. Uh, but you can see how much a lot of the detail has been preserved, obviously depending on your, compu on your computer, <laughs> depending on your printer. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, you can preserve a lot of that kind of like muscle uh, mass and stuff in the creatures, which is pretty not pretty nice. And obviously, the way that the fur works as well on oh, the bodies is also really not really cool. Um, I got I gotta love a good a good rat ogre. And considering the Games Workshop rat ogres aren't particularly nice, I think these are some very cool alternatives for you to drop into your armies and use on the tabletop. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But they look they look like they've hulked out as well, which is cool. It, <laughs> abomination equivalent. Yeah. Uh, you you kind of imagine a grace here just standing behind one going, yes, yes, go, go, medical, yes. <laughs> that is exactly how Scaven speaks. So yes, it is. That is right on the map. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I, I have practiced for many years. <laughs> Gracia, thank you. Uh, 
Justin. But yeah, some really awesome bits and pieces in here that sort of like allow you to kind of like fill the gaps in armies and sort of add in maybe some character figures to units. Like obviously we're talking about Kings of War there. One of the things, nice things about that is that you can build footprint units. Hmm. So you don't have to have rank rank and file stuff that is all individual models. Yeah, you don't need so, to make sure they all fit side by exactly. side so you can have yeah. a unit like this. Mm -hmm. So you like have like a burrow as part of the regiment tray yeah. and then these bursting out of it or something if you're trying to make a sort of like scouting yeah. unit or something on the table. Stop that. You say cool. burrow, I say dwarven mine. <laughs> just, yeah. you bursting know, their it, way out of a, bur of a uh, dwarven mine that they've taken over. Yes, exactly. Well, yeah, I mean, they, they yeah. move in and they go, well, it's a fixer upper. Let's dig. <sighs> Oh, wow. I was just about to say, can you look at that profit? Oh, I kind of want to see the rodent swarm. Get there oh, wow. Uh, He's wise. This, this mm -hmm. uh, is awesome. Well, the horned rat has obviously gifted him many things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> He's quite cute. I like him. Oh, I like the, him. The, the smoking skull is lovely. Yeah, I didn't see that. That's nice. Mm. Unholy brotherhood fascinating and the thing yeah oh so, wow yeah somebody's been playing with their chemistry set and shouldn't have done <laughs> that because they found a sewing kit the some master kind. molders have been doing well That's the, yeah. yeah some kind of radicalism oh, oh boom <laughs> <sighs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that was good. Well done, Free. Yeah. Well, What's quite, you know, it's quite nice about these. Uh, it's, well, I think this is how they work in Warhammer anyway. But when you attack someone with these and they die, they actually burst open at the seams. And oh. all the rats flood out that are inside it, all over everyone around it. So they are properly abominable, which is, which is very cool. I like that they kind of added a few more, sort of like slightly more chaotic elements into a lot of these as well. So you tend to obviously see sort of like weird sort of scientific creations and that kind of mm. thing. But I like that you've got almost like that sort of um, chaotic moor in its chest there yeah. that has sort of come through from yeah. the corruption elements of, of their ratty society as well. Uh, I have to wonder if one of them gets locked up, locked jaw, does it just rip that head off and leave it hanging mm. off wherever it's bit? Probably. Yeah, yeah. more than likely. <laughs> yeah. It is the grim dark after all. Oh. <laughs> that is some excellent creepy creepiness. They are scary. Speaking yeah. of engines. Exactly. Because yeah. we are. Yes. Look oh. at that coming for you. Coming at you like Cleopatra. <laughs> a, a regiment of tunnel runners made from those mm. would be excellent. That's someone who's had a little bit extra to it to make it a little more ramshackle. It's too well uh, engineered. I, I have Maybe they're just no really cunning rats. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's the pod racer that's next to Anakin in Phantom Menace? Because that guy looks <laughs> like... <laughs> yes. Saying he looks like Sebulba Sebulba. the dog. That's <laughs> very harsh. That's very harsh. I know dogs and they wouldn't thank you for that. <laughs> Doug the Fug for one. <laughs> True. You want to have a look at the wee rune swarms as well? Mm. Yeah. Oh. The, the, those are just... Yeah. Those are perfect for any dungeon runs you want to do. See, mm. I've been I've been playing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles at the moment, and this is the kind of perfect thing I'd want for the Rat King. Mm -hmm. mm. This is what happens when Splinter went mad and and, and changed completely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, the, bit the, more, too so, much mutation that one. Yeah, yeah, you know, Shredder just went. I shall mutate you back into a rap. Oh no, I've made a horrible mistake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's interesting, mm. especially. It's not a particularly, it's a comprehensive range, but it's it's a relatively new um, I suppose creator. It's a creator. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so it's not, not brimming filled with lots and lots of things yet. <laughs> yeah, I did see one group of them that were wearing like coolie hats a little further up. I do want to see those. Ooh, yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it was one of the reasons why I wanted to kind of pick these mm. these folks out because I kind of seen them on the front page of my mini factory. Yeah, mm. and was like, that's kind of neat. Uh, and and they seemed yeah. relatively new, and I liked that it was a more condensed range because obviously most of the time when we dive into these three D printing sec sections, we look at like in. five pages worth yeah. of stuff. Yeah. But if you're specifically looking to make a Ratman army, this is a pretty good way to go, I think. So, yeah. uh, and Ratman. print it all off at home. Once yeah. you bought the files, they're yours forever. So. Mm -hmm. And you can make as many of them as you want. There you go, the immortals. The immortals. And cool. <laughs> we'll work our way down to it. Ah. Not gonna yet. We'll start with the demon uh Scudzlack. Mm -hmm. 
No Kegs War Army is, you know, on the tabletop without one because he's filth. I don't know. Depending on <laughs> how that is, filth. If that thing is like broken down into multiple parts, you could scale them up and do like a big, massive rat monster. I can't remember the name of it. Two tiles. That's creepy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mean sort of like the Vermin Lord, do you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's exactly what that is. I don't think that will need scaled up. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But yeah, very nice stuff indeed. Doesn't say what size these are on the setups, do they? No. Well, yeah. He's fine. Say to me. Rat monks. Yep, plague monks. Mm -hmm. All with bulbous protrusions everywhere. Covered in bubos, yes. A pain pain in the ass in uh, Vermintide 2, those. (laughs) I remember. Especially playing with randoms. (laughs) Pain in the arse to put together. I have 120 of them. (laughs) <laughs> are they painted no <laughs> color me surprised yeah. well, they be painted they're built I can game with them mm. I think yeah. I painted with, I've, I've 6,000 points of ratkin slash mm. skaven they'll get painted whenever I can be arsed mm. but they're all on bases so I can play with them today yeah. that's the important thing kids Yeah, paint a yep. secondary to be able to game with them uh, again for me it's always just get color prime down I can tell what's mine what's yours Oh, look at these. Oh, those are cool. Oh, these are I great. like those. They're so all of the rest of them so far have been quite gross. Ratty. Rat-like. This isn't. They've been gross and look like they come from the sewer and look like all their weapons have been built from scrap that has come. These don't. These look like they're trained. Well, I mean, you've, you've got your city rats that we've seen, and I guess these are the country rats. Ah, uh, yeah, you're right. That's well, definitely. Definitely an interesting take for gutter runners and assassins. Yeah, plan ish in, in a different style. Yeah. Considering how the um, how samurai like the um, I can't remember what the name of them are. I, I know what they are in Kings of War, but I can't remember what they are in Warhammer. But the shock troops, the, the elites, they were samurai like. They even had the the oh, banners on the storm backs. vermin. Storm vermin, that's the yeah, one. Yeah. But they never really lent into the Asian feel for the the gutter runners and and assassins as much. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that looks terrific. Also, because I rewatched uh, Big Trouble in Little China recently, <laughs> see the, the three storms. <laughs> oh yeah, those hats will do it. Those yeah, hats I kind of feel like Dirty Harry. Will do it. Oh, I like them. Yeah, there's some terrific stuff in there. Yeah, a sure. comprehensive range. So whether you're playing Warhammer Ninth Age or Kings of War. It has the it has the variations and changes in there that you need if you want mm-hmm. to field whatever you, you want to field. Again, hack pole riders are scum. People should not should mm-hmm. not field hack pole riders. Certainly not um, against me yeah. anyway. I reserve the right to field them against other people Ooh. myself. That's different. <laughs> yeah, although if, if you want, this would make a great alternate warband for something like more time. Mm. Well, yeah, well, you could yeah. always fly those in and, and use them as your scaven in that. That'd be pretty cool. Or if you're playing any skirmish game as well, yeah. use them for Vanguard and that kind of thing as well. Just, oh, yeah. yeah. Good for Beautiful. objective tokens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, RPG, dungeon crawlers. Yeah. Fantabulous. Me like you. Sweet. Only existing on my mini factory then? Uh, there is an Etsy page. Uh, so uh, so if, if you're like me and yeah. you don't print, you, you can, can go at least check buy them. Yeah. Yeah, I'll make so, someone to print it for you. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll make sure there's an Etsy link down in the uh, description below. So cool. check that out. Surely you could bribe a wild John or a wild Shea to print them for you, Jerry. <laughs> Seems like an awful lot of hassle on my heart. Whereas if somebody's <laughs> just going to send me a box with miniatures in it, it's much easier. Um, yeah. It requires no thought on my behalf at all. So there we have it. Uh, resin Warfare. Mm-hmm. on my mini factory and partly etsy as well if you want to get into rat people then this is a great way to do it and uh go rats did you win one of our prizes find out on our prize claim center over at ontabletop.com here we list all our previous prizes and those who have won if you see your username fill out the form to claim your prize all prizes must be claimed within 30 days shall we finish things off with some kickstarters Oh, yes. Yes, please. So uh, we stick with the realm of 3D printing, mm. uh, but we look to Neil from Real Terrain Hobbies, who has been putting together 
a rather fantastic uh, Kickstarter project. So uh, you may have seen this teased and hinted at a couple of months ago when we talked about this amazing diorama that he built uh, for use as the Hobbit and, and, and the Shire mm-hmm. in Lord of the Rings. This is the culmination of all the work that he did in the background alongside all the stuff with Woodland Scenics. So uh, he couldn't find hobbit holes or halfling homes that he liked. And so he decided to design and build some himself. And so the hillside hamlet has come to life, as you see here. Um, This is a range of different uh, halfling homes, six of them, at least for now, that have been designed and built for you to print off at home. Uh, It should also be noted that they've been designed to print on small printers as well. So if you're someone who's managed to ferret one into their bedroom, John, uh, then these are great for you because you can kind of set this up and let this run without having to worry about having to have a massive 3D printer or a room specially designated to it. Um, As you can see, they look stunning, Um, all designed very much to kind of give that sort of Shire Hobbiton feel, although you could obviously tweak them take off the round doors and add on alternative ones if you wanted to as well. Wow. They're available as add-ons and stretch goals later on down in the campaign as well. Um, but yes, these just give you the frontages. You print these off and use them, and then you can create something just like that. <laughs> well, yeah. you need to put together some lovely foam hills or something and then work these into the front and add a little bit of Mod Podge on the back. Honestly, ready to go. So, yeah. best thing for this, use some upholstery foam. Something just like that as well will be perfectly oh, fine for doing something like this. Yeah. It's stuff like this that's going to make me buy a bloody 3D printer. Look at the <laughs> beautiful <laughs> Hobbit hole. But yeah. you have friends who have them. I know, but you're, you're also in a. But we've asked you to build to print things for ages, Justin. <laughs> oh, yeah, but I don't like you. Oh, wow, <laughs> kidding, kidding, geez. kidding. Wow, right on, right on live YouTube. God, that's <laughs> yeah. shocking. Uh, but, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Obviously, you can buy frontages like this from Forge World. Mm. They obviously cost a bomb. Mm. These do not cost a bomb, and they look just as good, if not better, I would say. And than you can make as ones. many as you want. Yep, they come in so many different variants as well, so you can make some really nice buildings with these. In addition to having the frontages, you also have things like the chimney pots and stuff like that. You also got a bit of scatter terrain, which we used on the board as well. So you can have a little sort of brewery set up. You can have a well. Uh, you can have ale sort of barrels. You can have tables laden with food. You can have fences. You can have a little bench for your hobbits to sit down on when they're having a break. From you all that can. Work Telling that people they, they don't, don't want visitors do. today. Exactly. You can celebrate yeah. Bilbo Baggins' 111th birthday. Exactly. Yeah, yeah yes. you can build Bilbo's birthday. Try saying that five times fast. No, I can't do it. No, stop uh, but yeah, uh, it's a genuinely lovely little piece of uh, well selection of different kits that uh, Neil has put together for this. Uh, and the stretch goals have sort of expanded to include a lot of other stuff as well. Um, so they're throwing things in like market stalls, the ale wagons that we've seen. There's going to be a stone bridge on the way hopefully soon so you can make the little bridge at Bywater or something which would be nice there's a water mill as well so you can build Ted Sadiman's mill oh, yeah. oh, you get God. the Mel's terrain book yeah you can also get the train yeah, book cool. which was, uh, yeah so that's that's a book that um, uh, Neil has used extensively throughout a lot of his videos and things and referenced mm-hmm. that quite a lot because obviously Mel's an excellent chap uh, has done amazing stuff. Um, so why not use the tips and tricks that he's brought to the tabletop? Of course. Mm-hmm. And there are those alternative doors and things you can use and barrel toppers as well. So lots and lots of different bits and bobs that have been put in there. And I would love to see an inn. Mm. And I need to see the green dragon I recreated know. by Real Train Hobbies. That would be amazing. Uh, <laughs> you know, you've got a complete Hobbit in, in the Shire with that, I think. Mm-hmm. So uh, that'd be brilliant. Fantastic yeah. stuff. Yeah. I wonder if they're going to do a fireworks cart. That would be cool. That would be cool. This yeah. is when me and you get all this stuff on the table, Ben. We finally build our shire, then they bring out Rivendell. And then we just end up having all of Middle Earth. <laughs> <laughs> I want someone to build a six by four version of Moria so you can play from the start oh. of Moria and the Watcher in the Water all the way through to the other side of the Bridge of Khazad Doom. Yes. I mean, and the mirror. And the, yeah. yes. that is doable. I yeah. think with her starts, I could do something like that for you. Build it for me, Justin. <laughs> if you Near. build it, they will come. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. ah. it's I set myself up for this one. There's 23 days left to go on that, the Hillside yes. Hamlet. Uh, worth jumping in if you're a fan of halflings, hobbits, or any of the shorter folk. Mm-hmm. Uh, I see there is also merchant pledges available. Yeah. One mm-hmm. thing I would absolutely love for people to do 
on these Kickstarters where they have merchant pledges available is to post a list after the Kickstarter. Done that, yeah. Because yeah. just because somebody's selling it doesn't right. mean I'll ever find them. Um, but just having an update. So if you're watching, and you won't be, but if you're watching, as an update afterwards, just do update 57. Here's all the people who sell the stuff pre-printed. Yes. Yeah. And just yeah. add that. And more Kickstarter yeah. people should be doing that. Yeah, no show some love to your merchants. No point in selling them if nobody can ever buy them. Um, but otherwise, a terrific set of, of little holes. <laughs> and yep. talking of little holes, we're going to be poking some into each other with the last Kickstarter. Yes. Oh, okay. uh, so pre prepare your katana, mm. uh, because this is Senjetsu Battle for Japan by the folks at Stone Sword Games. Uh, so this, as the tagline says at the top, is a tense, fast-play samurai dueling game uh, featuring beautiful miniatures mm. in 32 millimeter, uh, expansive <laughs> deck crafting mechanics free. Mm. Oh, and uh, oh. memorable showdowns. Uh, yeah, so this is a game for one to four players. Uh, games themselves play around 20 minutes, which is oh. incredibly fast. Mm -hmm. Very, very good stuff. Uh, and can be played by ages 14 and up. As the numbers would suggest, you can play this solo, which is pretty cool, but we'll get into really? that a little bit. Oh. Yeah. Uh, you can also play this cooperatively and competitively. Competitive is the kind of way that you're kind of going to play the game most mm. of the time. Uh, the way that this game works is that you either use a pre-constructed or a constructed deck based on your particular samurai and on those cards as you can see there you'll have different strikes and blocks that you'll need to play from your hand now strikes and blocks are sort of worked out simultaneously as you play and so what you do is you'll draw your you'll choose your ability card from your hand and you'll play it face down and reveal it and then what you have to do is you compare the strikes and the defenses against each other but because this is samurai mm -hmm. there's an additional element that's been worked into that as well in terms of the speed at which you attack and defend because just because you played a defense card doesn't mean you're going to be able to block the opponent's strike Depending on the initiative values on the card, the blade might have just snuck through and nicked you or something like that as well. Uh, so there's some really nice sort of like back and forth you can throw into this. And obviously because it's got that sort of cooperative and competitive elements in there, and then the solo two, you can play with maybe two samurai versus another two, which would be pretty awesome mm. to see as a little kind of like um, ruckus on the tabletop. Or we'll just take it very seriously and do a one versus one duel, which I think is really cool. Um, the artwork and the miniatures, as you can see, as we've been looking at all this, is just stunning. Mm. Uh, and I love that it sort of flows into that idea of that kind of almost peaceful brutality that you get within the samurai world, which I think is just fantastic. Um, I will say that the solo version of the game uh, is very interesting as well because it kind of plays out like a narrative campaign. Uh, so it's called The Path of the Ronin. And it's part graphic novel and part campaign. And so every battle you fight going forward will tell more of the story, become more challenging. And obviously you've got that little AI deck that's going to be flipping over and all that kind of thing as well, which would be really nice to see how that works out. But uh, yes, uh, a really beautiful looking game and a fascinating concept. Uh, I love the idea of a dueling game. Cutting it down to 20 minutes means that someone's not going to get salty about it either. Mm. <laughs> Very time to play again. <laughs> yeah, plenty of time to play again and beat your opponent with their deck, of course. Yes. Mm. That's the way you're going to do it. It, it reminds me of Bushido Blade. Yeah. Mm. Where Actually, you're, yeah. You're, you're playing, because the whole point of that was you play the play style of the, the, the fighting style plus the weapon you're using. Yeah. And there was no health bars in it. So it was who could execute the strikes most proficiently. I also like that it's not just we've done a hex map, we've done a alternate hex map with a different color on it, but there are sort of three hex wide bridges. There's showdowns at Riverside and that sort of thing. So there, the style changes if you're playing a character where you've constructed a deck that's very good, where you've got a lot of open space to maneuver. All of a sudden, coming up against somebody on a bridge with a naganata means you're probably going to get your teeth knocked out. Um, <laughs> although I, I, oh, I'm happy because I'm seeing the samurai's natural predator oh. and ninja. Samurai's natural predator, the Portuguese. <laughs> Actually, fair point. <laughs> Very true. With a pistol. I think what I'm appreciating a lot about these is the cards. The amount of games that I have played on board game where there is symbols, where there is everything, too much information on a card, and then you've got the information you need to take in that's on the board. Mm -hmm. These have got exactly what you need to on the card. Yeah, yeah. it's all baked in. 
Uh, that's and, nice. it's very, and it's very minimalist, which is what yeah. you expect in Japan. Mm-hmm. Everything yeah. should be minimal. Yep. Mm-hmm. Definitely want to give yeah. this a go. Yeah, for, for anyone who's uh, recently perhaps played Ghost of Tsushima uh, on PlayStation or something, can you really let the idea of kind of like that samurai dueling uh, sort of look and feel, the that aesthetic, this is very much sort of tied towards you. If you're a bit of a Kurosawa fan as well, I'm sure you'll mm-hmm. find lots to love about this. Uh, yes, very fantastic stuff here um, from uh, Stoke Sword. Yeah. Honestly, I'm going to say this, you're pledging for the core game. That yeah, is fairly- reasonable. Fairly cheap, yeah. That is. <laughs> I'll go one step further. So. If you go to the deluxe version, it's forty nine pounds. Oh wow! So and you yeah. get so much extra in that. That's so, ridiculously good value. The core, you, will you get standees? Well, standees is part of everything. You get no, miniatures with everything. No, you get miniatures with both, but nice. um, but the the core is limited in what you're going to get with it in ah. comparison to so your core. There, this is forty eight hour early birds. So by the time you watch this. This will be gone. You'll have to yeah. up your pledge from thirty-five pounds to was it thirty-eight or forty, whatever it is. Mm. Um, but the uh, is tempting. The deluxe version has a mm. chunk more in there. It's interesting well, to see your regular deluxe version is still forty-nine. Yeah, but there's some of the bits and pieces go out. Of it. The, er, the early birds are some of the characters and a few other bits gotcha. and bobs. Gotcha. You get extra stuff for being yeah. early. Uh, so there's even been a few previews, so mm-hmm. uh, including a solo version of it as well mm-hmm. by the Hexy Beast. So nice, nice That's to see. Uh, good if you are interested and want to see how a game plays out as well. Mm-hmm. Stone Sword have done a couple of spanking games already, and they've a few others on the way. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what comes next. I knew this one was coming because they told me the next, <laughs> the next one is is very surreal and takes things in a completely different way so you're going from the the uh, bushido like honorable combat of japan to um a fantasy version of oceans 11 with wow. and goblins and stuff attempting to do oh, bank very cool. and yeah. i like that i like the fact that they they aren't railroading themselves into one thing they started off doing um card games so obviously that's where their their sort of love lies but they're they've gradually been expanding into miniature and board oh, games nice. and and sort of taking things in different directions and, and mixing it up as well which is Holdings. always good to see uh there are 21 days left oh, if you want to get in senjutsu the battle for japan um then definitely check that one out if you have a flux capacitor and you can go back to now when we're filming this, then you can get an early bird. <laughs> otherwise, I'm afraid you're going to be missing out on a couple of figures there. But otherwise, there's it. still plenty in it uh, and at a very reasonable price as well. I mean, I may need to ask permission. It Gotta is always easier to beg forgiveness than to ask permission. <laughs> and on that happy note, I think that wraps us up for another week. We will be back with you again next Friday. However, if you can't wait that long, come over to ontabletop.com and sign up for a 30-day free trial. Become a Cult of Game member and you can check us out on Sunday morning. In fact, you are almost certainly will have to do that because next week we're going to be going all RPGE on you. So mm-hmm. we, we won't be here next Friday. Well, we'll be here, but just not talking about this. <laughs> we'll be talking about be other things. Mm. Like I say, you have to wait and see. There may be pumpkins. There may be pumpkins. Maybe. If you want a chance to win that extremist box set for Age of Sigmar, uh, then drop a comment below, be a subscriber, and be lucky. Otherwise, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.